Over the past four plus years, the world watched as Americans did democracy quite differently. Canadians paid particular attention, wondering what, if anything, might seep across the border. And while so far the kind of populism that roiled the U.S. hasn't found much traction here, Canadian democracy has polarizing strains that cannot be overlooked. With us to further the conversation of our TVO Toronto Star joint initiative, The Democracy Agenda, let's introduce, as is our custom from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in Calgary, Alberta. There's Jen Gerson. She's a journalist who's written for the New York Times, Maclean's, The National Post, and most recently is co-founder of The Line. That's an online newsletter. In Fredericton, New Brunswick, journalist Vicky Moshama, whose work has appeared in The Walrus, The Washington Post, and The Toronto Star, among others. In Montreal, Quebec, Andrew Potter, associate professor at McGill University's Max Bell School of Public Policy. And in the nation's capital, there's Susan Delacourt, national affairs columnist at the Toronto Star, our partners in this endeavor, and we're really grateful to have all four of you alongside tonight for this conversation. And Susan, I will start with you first because it was almost a decade ago in the pages of the Star that you wrote, Canada isn't divided into left and right, but into fierce partisanship and total apathy. Do you think that's still <laughs> true today? Yeah, I do. I do think it's true. I, I had forgotten I'd written that, but... Uh, it's a good line. But yeah. <laughs> um, but yes, I do think there are still, uh, at, the, among, at the partisan level in, in Canada, there is a lot of um, polarizing forces. I think the interesting thing in Canada is they're not over specific policy issues. I think the, the polarization we see in Canada is about identity and values issues. I think that um, just about a, before the pandemic, if anybody can remember before the pandemic, um, we were in the middle of a very large national conversation about the blockades taking place uh, across the country, indigenous protests. And that was getting in, that was starting to be very, very fiercely partisan and, and very polarizing. And I, I think, uh, you know, there's been a suspension of it for a bit during the pandemic, but I think when we talk about values and identity in Canada, I think we do get into polarizing forces. Not as bad as the States, but, but um, not undisturbing either. It's interesting how that issue has not gone away, but the coverage of it utterly has. Don't you think? True. Yeah. 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 Andrew, let me get you to follow up. Do you see signs of a, deeping, a deepening polarization uh, due to rising or surging populist anger in Canada? Uh, I, I do, um, but I think I think one of the problems uh, that, that Canadians have in recognizing it is is uh, that we're too focused on on the American version of it. And I think in a lot of things we spend too much time comparing ourselves to the Americans and. and patting ourselves on the back about the Americans. Um, be because one of the interesting things about Canadian popula populism and Canadian uh, regionalism, as I sort of, I think I understand it, is that is that it, it, it manifests itself, the populism and polarization manifests itself as regionalism, um, not as anti-immigrant, uh, you know, trends or, or even any sort of um, pining for an authentic, uh, you know, national identity that, that never existed for various reasons. But I do think that Canada is a highly regional country, and a lot of those polarizing and, and populist excesses or, 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 or uh, impulses just manifest themselves as uh, just an alienation from the center and from one another. Um, I wrote a column in the Globe and Mail about a year and a half ago that uh, talked about a, a poll that ECOS did, I think, uh, about two years ago that no one really paid a lot of attention to, but kind of showed that Canadians don't really like one another that much. And to the extent to which they do, it's Albertans and uh, Saskatchewanians having a bit of a bromance, uh, you know, the Maritimes kind of like one another. But apart from that, everyone kind of just doesn't like one another. And, and I think that's, that's the way these impulses manifest themselves in Canada as sort of a mutual indifference and alienation, which is, you know, in a lot of ways as problematic as anything going on in the United States. Well, can I say for the record, I like you. In fact, I like everybody who's on this program tonight. <laughs> so that's a good start, anyway, for continuing our discussion. And in fact, maybe this is a good time to get out of central Canada. And let's go east to the Maritimes. Vicki, you used to live in Toronto. Now you're in New Brunswick. Do you... Do you sense or do you regard this kind of political polarization differently now that you're in Atlantic Canada? No, not fundamentally. Um, you know, I've lived in, I think, four, uh, four provinces in this country. And, you know, universally what I find is that 
despite people not liking each other, most Canadians are nice. They're invested in the concept of being nice and being kind to one another. They might have political disagreements. But where that starts to deviate and where, you know, what Susan's talking about, it comes to identity and values and that conversation we were having about Indigenous rights versus, um, you know, the rights of certain companies or processes that people feel were, were sort of justifiable, um, that's where, you know, the rubber starts to hit the road and kindness starts to fall apart. And that is where I think, you know, the conversations about people being in the center doesn't necessarily hold as much value. I think these are differences. I don't know that there's inherently a lot of value in liking one another when these are differences about what is right and justice for your community versus what is, you know, what is desirable for an economy. I don't think we have to like each other about one of those things. The question is whether it's starting to seep in in a much more toxic way that people aren't able to necessarily go to a barbecue with one another or they can't walk past one another without feeling that their clothing or, you know, a hat someone's wearing signifies, uh, you know, or requires an action or a political conversation that is much more toxic. I still think that, you know, the middle or the center isn't as valuable as it once was. And I think that's because these issues are much more trenchant and that's because Canadians value a lot of these things deeply. Hmm. Jen, I don't know if this is a fair observation, but I suspect it is a truism that when people in central Canada think of rising populist fury in the country, they probably think of Alberta first. Do you think that's fair? Yeah, yeah, I think it is fair. Um, I wrote a column for uh, Walrus a little while ago trying to explain Alberta to the rest of Canada, which is a perennial trope for any writer from Alberta. But one of the, the observations I made is that I, I, I don't think that Alberta is um, conservative as much as it is populist. And this, uh, you know, if you kind of see uh, populism um, as the frame for Alberta politics, things like the rise of the NDP in 2015 make a lot more sense um, than, if you, than if you assume that Alberta is just sort of reflexively conservative. Um, populism uh, is, is, is a word that has a lot of different meanings, though. Um, you know, one of the ways that you framed this question earlier, uh, you know, is, is is populism responsible for polarization? I think that puts the cart before the horse. I think that populism is a reflection of polarization. And I don't think that populism is a necessarily right wing conservative or left wing phenomenon. Populism just means that it's 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 more of a a grassroots phenomenon, a, a reaction against the the perceived corruption of elite or or oligarchic class. Like it, it's not, um, you know, we are we are when we think of populism now in 2021, we often think of Donald Trump and the rise of the MAGA hats and that kind of a, a of a framework. But that's traditionally not really what populism was all about. And I'm not sure that, and that's certainly not reflected in the kind of populism that I see on the rise in Alberta. No, that's a great point. There's a little bit of that, certainly. Yeah, that's a great point because I well remember in, uh, well, two election campaigns ago in the States, people saying the populism of Bernie Sanders might have been more challenging for Donald Trump than whatever Hillary Clinton had on offer. But Jen, follow up with this, if you would. Um, you, you know, you write about Alberta's um, fossil fuel-based economy and, um, well, you get a lot of very interesting feedback when you write about that kind of stuff. Can you give us some examples of the kind of stuff that your columns tend to provoke? Oh, you know, um, this is interesting because uh, uh, when I write about Alberta to the rest of Canada, I, I, I get to play the part of the, the, the arch conservative, um, you know, defending the homeland. And yet when I write about Alberta, Alberta to other Albertans, I get put into like the category of the, the raging leftist, right? Like, so I, I, it's, it's just always fascinating to me, me to see the feedback. Um, but, you know, I wrote a couple of columns uh, for Albertans, um, you know, for CBC Calgary recently, and, and also for the line, basically saying like the, 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 grievance-driven populism that I think Jason Kenney has been um, uh, riding for the last couple of years has failed to succeed. You know, it's actually alienated an enormous number of allies across the country. It, it, it makes the province look bad to the rest of the country. And it's also um, setting Albertans themselves up for failure because, you know, he sort of portrayed this idea that if, 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 if you know, Alberta just elected the UCP and kicked the socialists out. Uh, the price of oil would rebound because all of these issues were were the NDP's problem and the NDP's fault. The economic problems were the NDP's fault. And yet two years later, what do we find? We find that the economic situation hasn't improved. The tax cuts haven't brought jobs back. Keystone XL has been canceled. And we've got, you know, a failing war room and a joke of, of, of an inquiry into foreign funding. And I don't know what's going to happen with that equalization referendum. I'm waiting for it. It's going to be a 
great fun, great column fodder for me. <laughs> but I mean, these these tactics have fundamentally failed to produce the results that um, uh, Kenny was trying to promise they would. And as a result, I think that you're seeing a revival of this populist anger, but now against the, PC, the UCP. Well, let's put some numbers on this, because 1,500 Canadians uh, just a week and a half ago were surveyed by Public Square Research, and we're going to throw a bunch of numbers at you and our viewers and listeners right now, and then uh, I'll get you all to weigh in on this. Here we go. Sheldon, if you would. 77% of Canadians are said to be very angry about what is happening right now. 73% of Canadians, 73% feel like society is coming apart. 44% of Canadians say, I hate politics. Only 15% of Canadians have a great deal of respect for governments, but that is more than the 12% of Canadians surveyed who express a great deal of respect for the media. Altogether, 26% of Canadians have either not much faith or no faith at all in democracy. 50% of Canadians agree that people who express offensive ideas should lose their jobs. Half of people surveyed said that. 36% of Canadians are afraid of losing control to minorities, while at the same time, 87% agreed or strongly agreed that Canada does need to fix racial inequality. Okay, lots to chew on here. Let's pull this apart. Susan, going back to you first, let's start with government and media here. Uh, pretty small numbers when it comes to respect for government and media, and 44% of Canadians hating, that's the word they used, hating politics. What do you infer from all that? Well, uh, um, let's, let me try to be the uh, optimist. Not a lot of polarization on um, <laughs> those issues. Pretty much uh, unanimity on, on, on a lot of them. Um, I, I'm not surprised. I'm kind of angry about what's happening right now, and I think the pandemic has made people feel like society is falling apart. That's, um, that's understandable. I think the worry about people believing in government and the media I think that is something. I don't just say that because I'm employed by the media. Um, what I think I cling to here in Canada is so far we don't have a polarized media climate. Not yet. We've, we've had hints of it here and there. Um, but there, there is, um, media is in the middle here in Canada as much as it can. There, it leans a bit this way, a bit that way. But we don't have a... Fox News versus CNN kind of situation here. <laughs> right. What is that? Uh, sorry, Andrew, what do you think it portends for a democracy when you've got more than 70% of Canadians feeling angry about what's happening right now and feel as if society is coming apart? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously not not good numbers. Um, I guess, I, I mean, I'd like to sort of look and see how the questions were asked and what they were talking about. I mean, if you're talking about angry about the pandemic and angry about the handling of the pandemic, I mean, uh, there's very good reasons for everyone to be to be angry about that and good reasons to feel that society is coming apart. I mean, what one of the most interesting things uh, that's been happening in the last four years is um, you might remember after David Bowie died. Um, this meme went around, uh, like a, a tweet or a meme, where it said, uh, I'm not claiming that David Bowie was holding the universe together, but, you know, look around, <laughs> right? And, and, and ever since then, every year since 2016 has been widely held up as the worst year ever. Right. Every end of year media report is, well, that was the worst year ever. Right. I'm um, looking forward to the next year. And then that year is the worst one. And it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Right. And trying to pull apart why that's the case. Uh, would be an interesting thing. One possible answer is things are getting worse and worse and worse. Um, a, another possibility is that um, social media, and I hate to sort of say, well, just add the internet, right? And you have trouble. But there's definitely something to that, right? That, that uh, I mean, there's a reason why, a very good reason why doom scrolling was the neologism of 2020, right? This idea that social media is just uh, you know, one long scroll of doom. So um, I'm kind of hemming a high here because I don't, I don't know really know what to say except these are bad numbers. Um, and in the context of a pandemic, which has been, you know, pretty badly handled by every level of government in Canada. And again, we will always compare ourselves to the United States and look, oh, what a train wreck it is down there, right? But, you know, Canadian governments show themselves to be massively unprepared for the pandemic and massively incapable of responding strategically, logistically, uh, and coherently to it uh, at virtually every level. And the only ones who have done a good job are the Maritimes who quite quite soundly, and I, I didn't like it when they did it, but they, they rolled up the, uh, the borders and said, we'll see you when this is done. 
Um, well, having and, said that, having said what you just put on the record there, there is another number I didn't give, which is 88% say, my family and I are safe. So as much as we may want to criticize what the government's provincial, federal, municipal, celestial, whatever, are doing right now, 88% of people say, I feel safe, and so is my right. family. That's encouraging, I think, isn't it? It is, yeah. Okay, let me go on to some other numbers here. Uh, Vicky, I'd like you to weigh in on the fact that half the people surveyed, and I guess methodologically speaking, we should point out this was an online survey. Take that for what you want. 50% of those surveyed say you should lose your job if you say something offensive. Vicky, weigh in. What do you think of that? Well, I mean, I think that's always been true. You have the, you've had the potential to lose your job for saying something offensive where the entirety of the jobs have existed. What I think a lot of these numbers are masking, and I would love to see things like a racial breakdown, a gender breakdown, an economic breakdown of those surveyed, and I generally always do, but in Canada, we don't survey, we don't generally survey for uh, for the race of the of the respondents, and I think that that leads to a number of failings. But you know, there are concerns that people have about how, for a very long time, people with racist views, sexist views, anti-indigenous views have been allowed to hold positions of power without any notion of consequence or accountability. And I think that also speaks to the numbers that we tend to see about the media and government and a lack of respect. Um, there are communities who consistently have felt failed by these institutions. And what I see now in these numbers is that more of the country is arriving at the place that black and indigenous communities have always felt. To me, it's striking that in the middle of the Wet'suwet'en crisis, a friend of mine who is Mohawk, she and I had a conversation about, she said, I cannot express to people the scale or depth at which the social welfare and the social welfare net in this country is falling apart. Huh. And if, if I had told people that in February, they would have said, what are you talking about? It's fine. But a month later, it became very apparent and very clear that there were major failings, that there were huge gaps in this country. Um, and I think for a number of people on, you know, in the healthcare community, they've been saying for years, the long-term uh, long care facilities and the experience of personal support workers, of migrant workers, those need to be addressed because we have a major crisis in those communities. And they were either dismissed or underheard by both media and politicians. And so I think respect is a mutual experience. And if they're not feeling that from governments, and if governments aren't taking care to respect those communities or respect those concerns, then it's not surprising that there is a mutual antipathy coming back at them. Um, and so I think these numbers are possibly much more representative of what is the factual experience of how people experience and live through their governments. Understood. And I think politicians should be very concerned about these numbers. Mm -hmm. Jen, because you have written in the past that, quote, conspiracy theories are an intellectual disease, I want to ask you about those. Because if 73% of people think that their world is coming apart, does that does that go a long way to explaining why people are quite prepared to latch on to conspiracy theories that the 27% uh, of people who think we're doing fine think are crazy. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with what um, Andrew Potter said before, is that without really understanding the context of these questions, it, it, you know, we can read a lot into them than might actually be there, right? Um, you know, these are pretty vague questions. Uh, are we talking about the pandemic? Are we talking about, uh, uh, you know, what, what are the governments, generally speaking? Like, like I, I think there's a lot you can read into questions that are as broad as that. But no, I mean, I, I think that, yeah, the problem of conspiracy theories, the problem of um, uh, ideological bubbles, the problem of um, you, know, you being able to self-select your media with the help of the internet um, into your own kind of informational vortexes is, is, is um, a huge issue. I, I think that that is a problem that is not going away. Again, we don't have it as bad in, 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 Amer in Canada here as, as I think Americans um, are dealing with this problem. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the one thing that you tend to see and you tend to notice among people who believe in conspiracy theories is that nobody ever seems to believe in just one conspiracy theory. The second you buy into a conspiracy theory, that breaks your framework of trust um, and it drives you further and further away from mainstream sources of information and credible sources of information and further and further down the rabbit hole. So you find that once that that sort of framework is is broken, anything else gets in and it starts to eat at the brain. They're, they're, conspiracy theories are a little bit like maggots in the brain. Right, they, they 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 start to warp your your perception of the world to such an extent that your informational filters, your normal informational filters, break irreparably. Now, it, does that account for seventy percent of the population feeling this way? Probably not. Um, but there is no doubt to my in my mind that we are seeing sort of a rise in conspiracism and have been for the last you know twenty odd years. 
Uh, Susan, let me follow up with this. I'm interested in the 36% of Canadians who admit to fearing a loss of control to minorities. Who do you think those people are? Oh, anybody in a position of power who feels, I think, that, um, that every bit of progress is, uh, comes at a price to them. Uh, we've seen this for quite a while in Canada as well. I'm, I'm really interested in where these numbers do show polarization. And again, to loop back to what we were saying earlier, it's about identity issues. It's about, it's about people feeling that, they, um, that the world is organized now according to identities. Um, it, I think Vicky made reference to this too. We don't talk about the middle as much as we used to. We don't talk about a mass market middle. Uh, not like we did in the, uh, in the latter part of the 20th century. We talk about people living in niches and niche marketing and things that are customized to you. So uh, uh, to, to go back to your question, uh, that was a long way around. I think these people are um, the people who feel that um, uh, probably white, um, probably male, uh, the people who have traditionally had power, um, they and feel that it is being taken away from them because of their identity and not because of anything they've done. Are these the people who write you love letters after you write a column about having a conversation with the prime minister? <laughs> Very interesting question. Yes, <laughs> those are. Uh, uh, this is uh, almost a private joke, but uh, the letters aren't. Uh, Yet yeah, there is a definite um, tilt to the letters, and and uh, whenever I write something about the prime minister, neutral negative, whatever. There is a constituency out there. They are male. Um, they are older uh, because their reference points are usually to his father and something. Um, they usually make reference to the fact that this is what happens when you get women in journalism. You get prime ministers like Justin Trudeau. They feminize him. Um, so, yes, those are... Uh, I, I, I hear from them a lot and uh, they are... I, I think I could put them into a demographic group of um, what some might call angry white men. Well, let's go further. Andrew, do you want to call them the Trumpian lair of Canada's political culture? Uh, well, uh, sure. I mean, I'll go along with that. Um, I, I think th there's a problem, um, which we don't we don't think uh, I don't think we we, we address enough, um, which is that a lot of what's happening, uh, the identity politics um, and this, this Trumpian lair, if you will, um, is, is uh, closely connected to, I, I believe, um, the fact that um, since 2008, in particular, since the 70s more broadly, um, we've seen a, a, a fairly high level of economic stagnation. Uh, and economic stagnation is known to be highly correlated with uh, reversion to uh, identity politics, uh, resentment, tribalism, and so on. Uh, and it's opposite growth. Um, and while it's trendy to sort of like disdain economic growth, economic growth makes people more open minded, makes people more uh, welcoming of immigrants and so on. When when the economy is stagnating or even shrinking, uh, people adopt a very zero sum approach to uh, the wealth and resources that are available and and start to resent immigrants, start to resent minorities and so on. Um, and I think this is an ongoing problem. Um, the stock market's doing crazy things right now, um, but the fundamental problems of the economy have not been fixed. And uh, there's not very much evidence that the current government has much uh, in the way of innovative ideas for how to fix that. Well, having said all that, you know, uh, we, we should not leave the impression that all the numbers that came out of this survey were doom and gloom because, Vicky, we point out 87% of the people surveyed agree or strongly agree that Canada needs to fix racial inequality. Um, I mean, what do you want to infer from that? That's got to be some kind of positive development, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm interested to see, interested to see what, what that means and what people feel about that, because sometimes that means things like changing the borders or boundaries of where schools and school placements are. And in the American example, what we've seen in that in, in those moments is a rise of, you know, white, usually female led movements against any kind of integration. And so in the Canadian uh, concept, what do we do about the fact that a lot of indigenous communities are now demanding the rights to which they're entitled 
under the Constitution. Here in New Brunswick, you have the coalition of nations who are coming together to say that they actually own the title deed to about 50 percent of the province. As that case proceeds, the question is whether or not the rest of the you know province, the settlers, the white communities, and other racialized communities who are here will be able to hear those claims and those concerns without responding in a much more um, aggressive and violent way. Um, and I, I just want to, you know, go back to one thing that Andrew said about, you know, the co the connection between identity politics and economic anxiety or economic concerns. Identity politics is a phrase that was coined and invented by a collection of women called the Kumbahe River Co Collective. It was a group of black women who were studying their neighborhood and saying that legal and reproductive rights for black women simply don't exist, that these women existed in a space called identity politics, and that their experiences were defined by their identity. But what they were very careful to say was that economic concerns weren't in there because black women who were wealthy, black women who were poor, black women who were middle class were experiencing the same set of legal and reproductive concerns that weren't being met. And so when we use a phrase that was coined by black women and apply it to the experiences of the majority white community, we're really misleading people on what that phrase is supposed to do. Um, and I think that that's really concerning because, you know, identity politics is being used to mask and hide a number of sins. But I think the phrase itself should be really listened to and the what concerns of what that, that this founding ideology um, is being uh, manipulated in a way that does lead to further polarization. When I describe these concerns to people who are white and middle class, when I tell them about the origins of the phrase identity po politics, they usually say, oh, that's a different thing than I thought it was. And so I think we, we need to take a pause sometimes and explain to people what is happening. As journalists, I think we should take that very, very seriously. Instead of skipping ahead to what is the outrage, we need to explain the very basis and definitional terms of what's happening. And I think that step gets missed a lot. Andrew, you want to come back on that? No, it's interesting. I mean, uh, I didn't know the origins of the term. Um, uh, I, th I think it doesn't change the fact that identity politics, uh, you know, has been used by, by academics and, and journalists and other people to refer to a broader, um, a broader uh, set of, of concerns or, or claims and so on. Um, but yeah, that's it's interesting. Just, it's a miscitation, and I think that's as journalists and academics, we should take that, you know, as personal and professional concerns. Okay, duly noted, as they say on Canada land. Uh, let's move on to that. Was for you, Jen, because that's the world that you live in sometimes, right? Okay, Jen, let me put this to you. Not anymore. Not anymore. I know, I know. Uh, here's some numbers that I, uh, again, you know, uh, we don't want to leave the impression that everything is all doom and gloom out there because, again, in this survey, two-thirds of those surveyed said democracy isn't perfect, but it's working okay. 74% of people feel they have some or a lot of faith in democracy. 74%. 63% uh, say, I'm doing as well or better off than my parents. That is certainly not what you hear from uh, most millennials today, but uh, nearly two-thirds of those surveyed said that. And a good capitalist like you, Jen, will like this. 85% said competition is good for society. So what impression do all these numbers leave with you? Well, uh, firstly, I, I don't see that only 73% saying democracy is a good thing is necessarily a rosy number. I mean, to have almost a quarter of your population in the liberal democratic society lose faith in democracy is 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 actually quite alarming. Um, I would also be interested to see how those numbers break down demographically, because I know we've traditionally seen that uh, younger people are tending to uh, uh, demonstrate less, sh a less, a lower show, show of support for democracy than 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 older people, and I think that that is um, understandable when you consider that you know younger people in 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 our societies right now do feel like they've gotten the short end of the stick and that the system's not working for them. And so therefore, if the system's not working for them, uh, is it possible the political system's not working for them? And if the political system's not working for them, then maybe the democratic political system's not working for them, I think is the kind of the chain of logic there. Um, you know, why I find that alarming is that uh, the alternatives to democratic systems are traditionally pretty repressive, pretty totalitarian options. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I think that if you're talking about framing these issues within the context of reforming uh, a, a liberal democracy to be uh, better and more equitable and, and, and provide um, better opportunities for people who have been traditionally been marginalized from these societies. That's, that's, that's a really positive thing, and that would be a very um, uh, forward-thinking um, position. But to frame these concerns as, as um, uh, disillusionment with democracy itself 
uh, invites a much more radical option and, and radical options to him to breed uh, more violent options. And, and, and I think that that is a little bit more alarming. So I don't think that that's necessarily good news. Okay. Um, I want to watch the trend lines on that. Fair enough. Let me put that to Susan. Susan, are you a the glass is three quarters full person or are you deeply concerned <laughs> about the quarter of the glass that uh, seems to be filled by people who do not believe that our democracy is working well at all? I would have liked to have seen those numbers if Donald Trump had won. I think Canadians were quite riveted to that spectacle. Um, I, myself, uh, was shocked that uh, that a, a, a sitting prime, uh, president would deny the results of an election. I think, uh, I think Jen was saying this too, too um, I distinguish between politics and democracy. I think people don't like politics and don't necessarily believe that democracy is accomplished through politics. But I think they fundamentally believe that their vote counts and that the system should work. I just don't think they think that politics works. And on that, uh, they're correct. Uh, politics is not a great system for delivering democracy. Hmm. Politics is not a great system for delivering democracy. Really? No. I do away with political parties myself. That's a whole other story. That is a different <laughs> show, but maybe we got to come back to that in a future show. Mm -hmm. Get rid of all political parties in the country. Yeah, I like the way municipal governments function. I think the reason that people like municipal governments better is because there's no nonsense. Um, a lot of the polarization, political polarization, is fake political polarization. It is people deliberately taking extreme views uh, to fit into a political system that, that doesn't actually... We all don't think the way political parties do. I don't think that somebody is evil because they disagree with me. Um, but po the political system whips that up. Uh, democracy does not. Fascinating. Okay. To be noted for a future show. Let me, with just a few minutes left here, read something that uh, that was in the Walrus magazine. This is going back to September of 2019. Polarization is more often a politics of feeling than of fact, and the lack of an ideological basis doesn't make polarization any less real. It just suggests voters are driven less by the issues than they are by loyalty to their parties and acrimony towards others. The polarization that is growing here, then, comes from partisan identification rather than a groundswell of climate change denial or anti-immigrant sentiment or any organic shifts in voter ideology. Very much echoing the point that Susan just made. Uh, Andrew, let me put it to you, though. Can, can you think of something that might help get us out of this rut? Uh, you know, uh, yeah. Um, one thing that might help, um, I actually really like political parties. Um, I think they're great. I think they're really useful in our system of government. Um, Walter Badgett in his, in his, uh, you know, uh, book on the English constitution, uh, described what he called, uh, he, he praised parliamentary government for giving what he calls, uh, or, or generating what he calls cool partisanship. And he said that the, that the opposition and, and government sort of dynamic should lead people in power or people in opposition to be more moderate in their opposition, because once they're in power, they might have to sort of implement the sort of ideas that they're advancing and so on. Right. So he said the alternation of power within a parliamentary oppositional system should lead to cool partisanship. We have the opposite. Right. Um, why is that? I think one of the big problems is that um, we've got in this situation where uh, political leaders, especially the major parties, um, have turned politics elections into uh, a one shot game. That is, they run. If they lose, they quit politics. Right. Um, which is a problem because you no longer have to uh, there's there's nobody's nobody's um, calling you on what you're saying in opposition, because if you lose, well, you're not in power anyway and, you, and you're actually leaving government. Right. I think that if if political leaders would stick around uh, for one or two elections, um, that would actually help a lot. Uh, I remember when John Turner died, it occurred to me. You know, I think he was the last major party leader to stick around for two successive elections. Right. And uh, so I, I think. Uh, turning it less into like this one shot uh, win, uh, you win, you stay, if you lose, you, you go off and do something else uh, trend is a serious problem with our democracy. Gotcha. That's our time, everybody. I want to thank all four of you for coming on to TVO tonight and helping us out with this. Jen Gerson, Vicky Mochama, Andrew Potter, Susan Delacourt. Great to be with you all tonight and stay safe out there, okay? Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.